this house has a very rich history when it comes to literature. During the week of the Frankfurt Book Fair, it was actually a good tradition to have events in this very building. In a way, we're doing a small contribution to the rich legacy of this villa. My name is uh, Aisha Astruzaf. I'm executive director of the KFW Stiftung, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's event. A special welcome, of course, to our authors. I've heard uh, you've already worked very intensively with uh, Adania Shipley throughout the weekend, and very excited to hear your voices and uh, looking forward to, your, to uh, learning more about your work. <coughs> also, a warm welcome to our panelists. Thank you for sharing your perspective and experience and contributing to the dialogue that we have today. Um, a special thanks also has to go to our partners um, for once. The, uh, for one, the uh, Commonwealth Foundation, uh, who's represented tonight by James Tennant and Emma DaCosta, as well as our long-standing partner, the Goethe Institute. And um, we have Sven Menzing here today. I have seen, there he is, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, he's been uh, one of our long-standing partners in the uh, short stories program which we're having which then ultimately led to this first masterclass so without him and the cooperation we have with the Goethe Institute we wouldn't be here today so thank you for that. As the KFW Stiftung and I am not going to bore you a lot um, about what we do but one of the things that is at the core of our work is facilitating dialogues like the one today contributing to thought-provoking thinking and critical exchanges of ideas, ideas that transcend cultures, that transcend languages, and this is why I'm so excited to hear more about um, what you've all kind of delved into during the past couple of days, and uh, excited to, uh, to learn and hear more about that. Um, I want to give you guys center stage, but please uh, let me thank, and that is very important to me, the wonderful team of the KFW Stiftung for making this happen. And all of you who've been involved in the program know her, Daniela, obviously, giving her vast expertise, passion, motivation, and long working hours making this event happen. Thank you. And no event in KFW Stiftung happens without uh, Sonja, Sonja Alt. She's probably in, in action right now, <laughs> making sure everything works out. So also a big thank you to her for making that happen. And with that, I will uh, give the floor to you, Daniela. Thank you. We have an event today which has a broad title, The Politics of Translation. And so I thought I'd say a few words on this before we get started. Mm, we already had a meeting this morning um, with the participants of the masterclass and uh, the experts who will be talking today. And we've already been discussing intensively on the politics of translation in all its senses. So there is, on the one hand, for example, the perception side of things. Yeah. So who reads Arabic literatures? Um, who doesn't? And what is Arabic literatures even? What is that supposed to mean? What are the structural politics of the processes? There's the production side of things. So what does it mean to translate the Arabic language? Um, is that even possible in any way? And how do we transcend cultural um, individualities through literature. There is a collaborative process which can be complex between writers, editors, translators. How can we sort of tie the knot there properly? Um, in the end, the question really is, what needs to be done in order to have more stories, more perspectives from the Middle Eastern region on the bookshelves of the bookshops in Europe, but also in other Arabic-speaking countries, um, globally, really. This is why we're here today. So today's event is the result of ongoing conversations between the KfW Stiftung and the Commonwealth Writers. Um, that's the cultural initiative of the Commonwealth Foundation. And within the context of our partnership um, for the translation of short stories for the online magazine ADA, questions came up. Really, and the necessity to discuss the topic in more detail became apparent. So, thank you so much, um, dear James and dear Emma. I can't see her right now um, for your valuable input for the conversations we had over the past years in programming this. We're very honoured to facilitate to facilitate this international panel, which really aims to build a bridge between regional perspectives from the Middle East 
or the region of the Middle East and Europe by gathering um, super renowned, knowledgeable experts from all these different perspectives. We have translation, we have editing, we have publishing. So a very, very warm welcome to our panelists. Um, Alaa Laswani, thank you so much, author from Egypt. We have Lynn Gaspar, thank you for being here, from Saki Books, based between Beirut and London. There is a US-based translator, Elizabeth Jaquet, thank you. Um, translator from the Arabic language, I have to say. Piero Salabé, there he is, <laughs> from uh, editor at Hansa Verlag, um, here in Germany and uh, Palestinian author Adania Shipley, based in Berlin. Ah, there she is. Adania, a very, very warm thank you to you, particularly for your guidance over the past days. Because really, um, in the past few days, the Villa 102 already has been filled with literature from the basement to the roof. Um, under your guidance, 11 writers from Cairo, Mansoura, Alexandria, from Beirut, uh, from Stuttgart, from Ramallah and Jerusalem, have come together here to... Did, what did I forget? Yeah. Ah, there you go. <laughs> um, to, to discuss, to develop, and most importantly, to write. Yeah? Um, it's been rewarding, it's been insightful, um, it's been thrilling to participate in the conversations and observe the encounters professional encounters between alumni, of which some have participated in the workshops in 2014, some only last year, um, intercultural encounters of creative minds from different regions and countries, and um, of course, most importantly always, the personal encounters of people who've been talking online over the past months, who now gather here in Frankfurt, come together, some of them meet for the first time, some of them see each other again. It's been special to be part of this, thank you for letting me in. Um, one uh, writer said to me on, on Thursday that uh, in Cairo, and we're a bit proud of that, um, people have grouped up sort of independently and beyond the borders of the program between the Goethe Institute and the KfW Stiftung, and they refer to themselves as the Goethe Gang, <laughs> which, you know, is lovely to hear. Um, the Writer's Workshop, the Masterclass, I've already said it, is a cooperation between the Goethe Institute Cairo, hence the name, the Goethe Gang, and is a result from the Joint Short Stories program in the Middle East. So thank you to Sven Menzing and his colleagues in Cairo, Beirut and Ramallah, for the wonderful teamwork across borders to make this happen. Programming cultural initiatives in a non-European context comes with certain practicalities and limitations which cannot always be avoided. So we are very sorry to, um, no, uh, to, to tell you that Sama Ahafi from uh, Syria, who's based in Latakia, Syria, did not get the necessary visa to be here today despite all efforts from the institutional side. Her text will be presented in a masterclass performance reading by one of her fellow writers. Today we will be guided through by Daniel Madden. Um, thank you for doing so, thank you for being here. You will be um, yeah, coordinating us through the afternoon. <laughs> Daniel is a uh, professor for comparative literature at the University in Paris, the American University in Paris. He's prized many juries, among others, the Booker Prize, uh, the prize of the Literaturhaus der Welt in Berlin. Um, he's an editor, he, is, uh, he knows it all, and <laughs> we're very happy to have you here. Thank you, Daniel. Um, now, that's my key. Uh, we will dive right into literature and the reading. Please use the handouts you've all found on your chairs to follow the reading. And I'd say let's give the stage to literature. Let's all have an inspiring afternoon and evening. And um, Estem <laughs> Tiaum. Infizar. Asafiru sabahi tu zagzik. Ajrasul madarisi tu kra. Mutafarrika. يختفي الأولاد إلا الكسالة من الشوارع السماء زرقاء ببطء تصعد الشمس طرف المدينة كما تتقدم العربة الضخمة ثلاث عجلات تحمل ثلاثة أوعية زجاجية مرتفعة يرقص التمر الهندي والليمون والكركدي على نغمات الأرض المتنتئة من الجيد وجود أغطية تسير العربة بمعجزة أو بأيد صغيرة تضغط على الذراعين الخشبيتين تقفز الهامة الخفيفة في الهواء فلا تصلح للقيادة ربما تصلح للدفع 
أحيانا تقصر الظلال تتعرق الجثث وتلتحم يقسمها عبور العربة فريقين هات لك كاسة خروب يا ولد حرك العرباية يا ولد لم تتحرك انفجر الإطار الأمامي تجمد خطرت فكرة قفز حمود وبحث وجد منفاخا تناوله وجثى بسهولة جانب العجلة السوق يصرخ لا تلتقي الفوهتان يزداد غضب أصحاب المحال التقت فرح كما لو أنه اقتنى دمية نفخ المنفاخ معطوب كمشته من عنقه كف غليظة زنخة والأخرى تناولت المنفاخ لا لتنفخ ولكن لتهوي به على رأس الصبي كومته في الصندوق أسفل العربة وجرتها بعيدا عاد الأولاد من مدارسهم وغابت الشمس We were standing there for hours Protest number 67 There were no cameras recording what was happening as usual, I was dressed nicely in a manner befitting a non-violent protest. I was wearing a black suit and brown shoes. I slipped a small bottle of vodka in my pocket just in case things got dicey. I was standing at the barricade with some other protesters as well as a few rats and cats. We were surrounded by cars on all sides. The refugee camp was behind us and the barricade stood directly in front of us. We were in the middle of everything, but everyone was pretending not to see us. My mother told the crowd, ever since the Palestinian exodus, it's like we've disappeared, we've become ghosts. No one can hear or see us anymore. Whether we've disappeared or not, Abul Heja said, you can't have a protest in your own house, Go look around the camp. We're still keeping a low profile. We act like someone who doesn't want his neighbors to know he's taking a dump. Everyone laughed. Gas tank, a big, big shot drug dealer said, we have to keep a low profile. Even if we don't stick, stick our necks out, they know what we're up to. I wanted to cry for a second. I wanted to take off my suit and evaporate into thin air. There were no cameras. If it had been recorded in film, then it would be real. مقتطف من قصة الطيور. حين بلغت أمي السابعة من عمرها، أخرجها جدي من المدرسة. كانت تبكي لأنها لم تعد تميز الحروف على لوح الكتابة الأسود رغم جلوسها في الصف الأمامي. بدت لها الحروف طيورا بيضاء ساكنة على اللوح الأسود طيورا بعيدة في سماء سوداء لا يمكن تمييز ملامحها في النوم تأتي الطيور لتهاجمها تحاول أن تصرخ لكن أصوات الأطفال الآخرين تضغى على صوت صراخها زراعة حصادة كتابة تنقل الطيور البيضاء عيني أمي ثم تعود لتسكن فوق سطح اللوح الأسود كان بإمكانها أن تقترب من اللوح أكثر فأكثر وتجلس عند قدمي المدرسة طوال النهار حينها فقط كانت ملامح الطيور البيضاء الوحشية تتضح وتتحول إلى حروف طيبة ألف باء تاء ثاء لكن أبها رفض وبما يفيد التعليم البنات ودعت أمي الطيور الساكنة على اللوح الأسود لكنها ظلت تزورها في المنام من وقت إلى آخر تنقر عينيها كلما اشتد ألمهما بينما تسمع صوت أبيها دون أن تراه وبما تفيد العيون البنات Coat pocket On the first day of school my mother put her hand into my coat pocket and said I'll be there with you If I was too shy to raise my hand in class even though I knew the right answer, my mother's hand would lift mine into the air so that the teacher would call on me. When I got into fights, my mother would pun punch the other boys in the face, making their noses go numb. During exams, 
Her hand would pick my pen surreptitiously whenever I got stuck on a problem. When I got older, I forgot about the coat. But after my mother died, I found it in among the other things that she'd held on to and would be able to help me keep going. I took it to a tailor and asked him to make me a new coat that would include the old pocket. In front of a row of cars, I, who have a deep fear of cosmic laws suddenly going the wrong way, Across the street, holding her hand inside my tiny coat pocket. When I wake up in the middle of the night and open my eyes, remembering that my coat was nearby, I would see her hand holding a winged wolf by the neck as it was trying to sneak up on me in my sleep. In the morning, when I put on my coat and look at myself in the mirror like a victim facing their killer, my mother's hand reaches out and polishes the surface. The person across from me then stretches their hand out toward me gently. ينبؤني إنها ماتت فأبكي. أتجه إلى دولاب ثيابي وأرتدي رداء أسود كنت قد ابتعته خصيصا لهذا اليوم. يدور صداع في رأسي بشكل دائري. ينفذ من بين عيني ويخرج مخترقا طبلة أذني. تاركا وراءه طنينا يجمه نبضات القلب أشعر برأسي ثقيلا وأخاف أن ينفلت مني ويتدحرج على الأرض فأتناوله وأثبته جيدا بين كتفي بيدي أخرج للصالة الفسيحة مسندة رأسي بكفي وما إن أشعر به يميل جهة اليمين حتى أشد ركبتي لأحافظ على اتصالها به أشدها طويلا فيختل اتزاني وأسقط أرضا لتمتد آياد غير مألوفة لمعزين لم أقابلهم من قتل التقاطي أتلقى عزاء يبعث نكهة مرة في جوفي فأحشو ظهورا في فمي وأتجه نحو الغرفة البعيدة حيث الجسد الميت محرر رأسي من يدي القابضة عليه أقترب منها النائمة في وداعة وأرخي رأسي الثقيل فوق كتفها ينسحب الصداع في خجل إذ لا مكان له بيننا نلتئم معا وأخف قربها برأس مطمئن I walk for long distances. I render myself to the sadness of the city, heading down its side alleys. I've never been fooled by these wedding ceremonies scattered all over the seaside halls. To me, they are all the same person getting married daily. They just change their features and names. They ignorantly repeat the same pattern. I see their lives as cursed tales, replicated meekly and dully. They couple and arrange dates, they all say, I don't care about money, only morals matter. During their first week of engagement, they hallow morning texts, and once a week, cakes are served at the bride's family sitting room. Then, they give birth to Malak and Jenna, they live confidently and die peacefully, as if they had whole lives of their own, free samples, already canned and prepared just for them, while the most crucial choice they ever had to make was the color of their outfits. الجريمة من فوق عتبة الباب رأيتها تجري بخفة نحو مصيرها صنع لها جدي الفخ ودخلته هي بأناقة جسدها الطويلة البني المكس بالفرو القصير ورأسها المدبب القلق كانت تتشمم طريقها داخل القفص أينما اتجهت ضحك جدي لحركتها الخائفة ونادى عمي الأصغر ليحضر له المطرقة وبضربة واحدة داخل القفص أنهى ارتعاشة جسدها كنت صغيرة فصرخت لصحقها بهذه القصوة استمر جدي بالضحك بأسنان نخرها السوس كان أول قاتل أراه في حياتي بعدها كلما سمعت عن قاتل في مكان ما قارنت صورته بملامح جدي في هذا اليوم تخيلت السوس الذي أكل أسنانه وترك مكانها فراغا أسود وعودتني ضحكته بعد الانتهاء من جريمته الهادئة كل قاتل به لمحة منه وله صوته وله مطرقته التي ينفذ بها الجريمة ذلك اليوم البعيد حين اصطاد جدي العرس ليدفنها أسفل عتبة البيت التي كنت أحب اللعب فوقها قبل أن أتوقف عن ذلك قال لي مطمئنا كده هنرزق ولم نفعل
three corpses. Life here, life here is just a way of dealing with death. The sound that sounds like a quotation from something. You wouldn't know. It was the product of a lot of thinking and worrying. I can't actually remember if I have read it somewhere before. Maybe the sudden desire to die just means that you are tired of dealing with death on a daily basis. Wanting to stay alive, on the other hand, is like when you, I have to get up and go to the kitchen to make a cup of tea while everyone else watches a film that I wasn't really very interested in. But once I started watching it, my curiosity had been piqued. Where did the murder hide the body? Why did he stash it there? Can everyone else tell that I have hidden three corpses on my shoulders? The corpse of life, the corpse of death, and the corpse of language. I hide from them. I separate the signifier from the signified, so I can taste the in-between, like people do with Oreos. I perform an autopsy on the corpse of language. What contusions did it suffer before dying? Its temperature. How did it take its own life? Then I kiss it on the lips. I didn't slay any dragons when I was making the film. I didn't play the mezai or a prince, but my kisses did manage to revive the corpse of language. When it comes to life, it eats both of its sister's hearts. The burden of both corpses lifts off my shoulders. Shagaratu Laymoun. Fi zaman ba'id, qara'atu khabaran an imra'a suwaydiya tantazru muwafaqat al-dawla kay tasira ba'd mawtiha shagarat tut wa yasira zawjuha al-mutawafi shagarat saru kama halima ma'an. Qara'atu al-khabara bisawtin aali summa sarakhtu bihamas wa awsaytu ummi لا تدفنوني بل ازرعوني مثلهما شهقت أمي بعد الشر لكن أختي ليلى ابتسمت مستفسرة أي شجرة؟ سرحت قليلا قبل أن أجيبها شجرة ليمون سألتني لماذا بينما تتابع والدتي حديثنا باستنكار ولا تفهم لماذا أستدعي الموت بمسحة سخيفة ولماذا تجاريني ليلى في هذا السخف قلت ما أردت لأمي أن تفهمه لا أريد أن ينقطع عطري بعد الموت وأخفيت ما ستفهمه ليلى مهما دريت أود أن أجذب الناس برائحتي ثم إذا ما جاءوا لقطف ثماري جرحتهم بشوكي جرح خفيف يذكرهم بي فيعودون من أجله لا من أجل الليمون فحسب لا أذكر ما حدث لينفذ وصيتي كل ما أتذكره أنني عشت ظلاما طويلا في رحم الأرض قبل أن أنبت ذات صباح Dialogue. He, I'm staying here. Have you ever seen a tree get up and move away? It doesn't happen, not even after an earthquake. She, you can stay here alone then. I'm not a tree, I'm a bird. Have you ever seen a bird perch on a, a tree that's burning? I'm going to leave with the traveling mirages. Cold, hunger, and fear have taken their toll on me. He, you will find many green trees to build your nest on when you get there. But you will never stop searching for the tree that planted its roots in your heart. You will long for it. Heartbreak will kill you. She, hearts don't long for things that cause them pain. Whenever I can feel myself beginning to yearn, I'll remember how badly I was hurt. And that will soothe me. I have enough memories to last a lifetime. He. A heart that is soothed by the heat of pain will choke on the smoke of its bitterness. She, I will spread my wings wide to catch joy. Every small joy will be a window so my heart can breathe. He, only traitors leave. She, survival is another form of love. He, the fires will go out, the tremors will end, and green shoots will emerge from the ashes. She. So stay and wait for it, but I can't silence the pulse beating in my wings. He, I hope the wind is kind to you. She, I hope the flames are kind to you. Kindness laughed loudly and continuously for a while. Then it turned and walked away entirely alone. أين ما ذهبت؟ كتبت مرة على الفيسبوك إن لم تكن فلسطين محتلة فبأي مدينة كنتم لترغبوا العيش؟ 
عرفت أن سؤالي فتح شباك العودة في رؤوس أصدقائي صديق من فلسطين المحتلة عام 48 رغب بالعودة إلى قرية الخبيزة المهجرة قضاء حيفا واختار آخر الدامون وهي من قرى عكا المهجرة أيضا أصدقاء في الضفة الغربية أشاروا إلى حيفا ويافا وطبرية كان هؤلاء أشد اشتياقا للبحر من غيرهم صديقة من غزة المحاصرة قالت القدس أريد أن أقضي أيامي تحت قبة الصخرة صديقان آخران يقيم أحدهما في عمان والثانية في بيروت فلسطينيان من مهجري الجيل الثاني لابد أنهما تذكرا قصص جديهما عن المنشية قضاء طبرية وترشيح قضاء عكا فقد تمنيا العيش هناك أما أنا فأريد العيش في كوخ صغير تحت ثلوج الزرمات في شقة سعتها 35 مترا مربعا في نيويورك في خيمة على ضفة نهر مقدس في نيودلهي ربما في بيت طيني في مراكش أينما ذهبت سأكون على يقين أنني حين أعود سأجد بيتي الصغير في القدس هناك بانتظاري بلا قلق من استيلاء مستوطن عليه I was at my shop when a young woman turned up with a camera. She handed Darwish a photo she'd taken of him when he wasn't paying attention. She started apologizing right away because he seemed a bit unnerved by the surprise. I examined the photo closely and tried asking him what was wrong. He carried on as usual in the days that followed, arriving each morning according to schedule and saying hello to everyone. But he wasn't the same Darwish had been. One time he asked to see the footage from the camera outside Ftuh's grocery store. The camera captured his back as he faced his cart, among other things. Another time he swore that he had seen his Korean co-worker from back when he used to work in construction in Iraq. It turned out to be Rifat from the coffee shop. Then he disappeared. What did the photo capture? It, it was a photo of him busily making liver sandwiches as a cigarette burned beside him and people walked past. It was such an ordinary scene, wasn't it? I thought the photo was very pretty. I confessed that it was v even prettier than the photo of me taken by one of those young people who discovered themselves by taking photos of the old streets and the people in them who it turns out are actually movie stars. <laughs>